today we want to build models that are symmetric under a non-abelian group of transformations, right? We're particularly interested in the local version for these transformations, and thus we'll get a gauge symmetry for this non-abelian uh, group, right? Uh, there are two ways uh, in which we could go about getting the Lagrangian for such uh, a model, right? One, one way we could go about it is first uh, is, uh, is stipulate the matter content, the so-called matter content of our theory, which is uh, the fermions and scalars that you have in the theory, and say how they transform under these, uh, um, under these transformations that you have in the group. Right? Of course, there's a phenomenological decision there, Right? Uh, besides deciding which symmetry we want our Lagrangian to have, we also have to, to decide how these guys transform under that symmetry. Right? This is equivalent, if you remember last video, right, to choosing uh, the representation of the specific representation of the group. Right? I want to, to, to say how big these multiplets are as I, I apply the transformation, and that fixes how big these matrices are for my representations. And, and of course, that has phenomenological implications and, and which are observable, right? So I will uh, not be carrying this uh, representation index here just to keep the notation clean, but remember that I always have to decide on the representation of the fermions and scalars, right? Once I do that, of course, we know, at least uh, you can guess in, in analogy to what we did in the abelian case, that once I, I, I take these transformations to be local, which means these parameters uh, here will depend on the uh, position in space-time, right? Uh, then I'll be forced to introduce gauge bosons, right? And that's, uh, that's what we want to see today, or the property of those gauge bosons. Of course, there's another way you could go about this, which is to say, well, I, I, I know phenomenologically, again, that I have a spin one particle in, in, in my experiment, right? And I want a, a, a consistent theory for that spin one particle, which is explicitly Lorentz invariant. Right? Once you try to do that, you, you have to put a Lorentz vector field to describe that particle and enforce a gauge symmetry to eliminate uh, the non-physical polarizations for that spin one particle. Right? You get the same Lagrangian for the spin one part of your theory, uh, doing it one way or another. Right? It's important also to, to uh, see that the, the uh, terminology is not totally consistent if you go to the li literature, right? So some people call Young Mills theories, right? Theories with this matter content plus gauge bosons, right? And some other people, when they are talking about Young Mills theories, they are uh, talking only about the gauge bosons, right? We'll see. Uh, today that these gauge bosons, now that we have known abelian symmetries, they interact amongst themselves. So you could, in principle, have a theory of pure uh, gauge uh, bosons, right? And, and, and people are not consistent. Sometimes young Mills means that pure gauge theory, and, and some other time, times it also includes at least one fermion. Right? Um, what you see is that sometimes people explicitly say this is a pure young muse, and then that means only gauge bonds. So be careful with that. It's not, uh, not totally consistent. Right? So we want to focus now on this transformation. So I'll, I'll give a name to it. So I'll call this transformation V of X. I'll do the whole thing taking the transformation to be local now. So even if I'm not explicitly indicating this guy depends on X, again, I would not do that always because uh, I want to keep the notation clean. It does depend on X, right? This is where the X dependence is. And I can write also the infinitesimal uh, version of this transformation, which is given in this way, right? plus stuff of order 
alpha square and just reminding ourselves I'm assuming all the things I assumed on the last video to get Lie groups uh, and get unitary transformations I'm assuming that V dagger is V minus 1 right and that of course consequently that these guys are real and that T dagger is equal to T so T is Hermitian right and most of what we'll do also assumes uh, SUN symmetries so these guys will be the generators of SUN right and uh, and that's especially interesting because uh, this is the group that shows up in the standard model of particle physics right so it's, it is the model that is phenomenologically more relevant uh, for the description we have of particle physics today right so now uh, I have to come up in the same way I, we did in the abelian case right I have to come up with a covariant derivative for the symmetry right and that is defined so that if I apply that covariant derivative in an object that transforms under the group the derivative itself transforms in the same way as the object so when psi goes into v psi the derivative goes into v of x derivative again right so the derivative is covariant in the sense that it transforms in the same way as the object in which i apply the derivative in this case a fermionic field right and that of course is done by introducing here a gauge field right so I, i'll define a, a new field by writing this derivative so this is what i'm defining here it's important to notice now that since this guy uh the derivative itself this uh, the psi right transforms with a matrix Right? so we rotate in this matrix space that means that here in the covariant derivative I need to have also the generators right otherwise I wouldn't uh, it wouldn't be possible to to get this relation because this guy is rotating in this internal space right rotating under quotes but uh, uh, that means that the covariant derivative must rotate it too in order to be able to satisfy this condition right now i can use this condition here to get the transformation properties of this new field i introduced right it's already a vector field just by looking at the index here right but also i need to know how it transforms not only under Lorentz transformations but now under these internal symmetry we call these symmetries that which are not transformations of space-time but transformations of the fields themselves right internal symmetries of the system if the, the model is symmetric for that transformation right? so i'll just take this equation now and substitute the covariant derivative here and see what that tells us about the transformation properties of the gauge field right so on the left side i just have del mu minus a g a mu a t a prime right transformed acting on v uh, psi prime so this is just the derivative this is psi right and on the left side i have v of x just copy the derivative again del mu minus i g a mu a t a acting on psi so on the left side left hand side of this equation this prime goes straight to the a here right because as i said this is an internal symmetry it's not doing anything to space time and everything else here is just uh, uh, numbers right this is a matrix of numbers this is a number so nothing else transforms this goes straight here and this guy I can re rewrite as V of X psi of X right this is the transformation of um, 
of the fermionic field. Okay, the main thing I, I want to be careful here is to not commute stuff that do, does not commute, right? For instance, these Vs here, they have uh, uh, the generators inside them, right? So I cannot commute V with uh, these uh, matrices here. Remember that these are, are all matrices, the representation of the generators. So let's start from the left side here with this derivative, it acts on these objects. So I have a del mu v times psi plus a v del mu psi. This is it for the derivative. Then I have this part, right, which is a minus i g a prime mu a t a times this one, so v psi. I'm suppressing all the axes just to make it short. Then on the right side, you have v del mu psi. This is the derivative part. And then this other one, which I need to be careful not to commute. This is minus i g v v a mu a t a psi right now I, you see there's a part that goes away here right it's the same on both sides and then i can uh, write this as an operator acting on psi because i don't i don't care about psi right i want the uh, uh i want the transformation for a right and that becomes del mu v minus i g a mu prime a t a v there's a v here right acting on psi and that's equal to this part here right which was just copy down there now since uh, this must be true for any psi Right? These two brackets must be equal. And I can now isolate the transformation property for this guy. So let me just take the two brackets down here. Right, This needs to be the same as this one. And now I just delete the brackets and isolate A prime. Right? Uh, this guy comes over here minus sign and I, I divide everything by minus ig so I get an extra minus i over g here right and, and that is uh, almost what I want right uh, now I just have to get rid of these v transformation on the left side here and I do that by contracting both sides from the right with V dagger remember uh, remember that uh, V is unitary right so if I multiply by V dagger here uh, I'll eliminate this guy this derivative part there's uh, something I can do right because as we know del mu V dagger V is zero because this is just one right this is just the identity so this is one that means i can change these uh the derivative from one to the other right i can just write del mu v v dagger as minus v del mu acting on v dagger if i do this on this side then i'll have uh, v to the left of this guy and the dagger to the right of this piece. And the same will be true for the piece that I have here. I, I can bring this V to the left and the dagger to the right and write a nice expression, right? Which is what I want. So V dagger V disappears here because I'm contracting with the dagger. So this first piece is just A prime, A mu prime A, right? T A is equal. And then I have V to the left of everyone here, right? It's just V times 
this piece plus because I'm exchanging this derivative I get this extra minus here i over g derivative because this derivative is now acting on v dagger which is sitting here to the right right and that is the transformation for this object which is a matrix right that's the important thing this is how these uh, uh, non-abelian gauge fields transforms right now there's a, a little more more we can see if we look at the infinitesimal version of this transformation this is a, a little bit hermetic right if you don't know a lot about group theory but the infinitesimal one is quite transparent so let's write it right what i'm saying here is that a mu a t a goes into this object which now i'll write as uh, these guys explicitly right as the infinitesimal version which for these guys just plus i alpha some index b summed over again repeated indices are all summed over right now the middle part i just copy this a mu a t a plus i over g del mu del mu is acting on everything to the right here right and that's again the infinitesimal version of that we'll just have a one minus i alpha some other index d t d right this is hermitian so i don't need a dagger this is real the only change is in this sign right plus of course order alpha square terms which i don't care right now i can reorganize this right at disregarding everything that is not linear on alpha right because that will all be dumped into this part so starting with this one here i have of course the simplest part which is just a mu a t a now one times these and i take the derivative acting here right it, it gives me a zero for this one and so i just have the derivative acting on this piece which i'll write explicitly there's an extra minus i here right uh, so that's just plus one over g del mu alpha d t d right now i have to worry about this part if i take alpha here uh, then i cannot take another alpha here and vice versa right because i only want the linear parts so i'll get a piece that is one times a times this alpha so a will be in front of this alpha d td right and another piece which is this guy so the alpha b t b in front of a but then the term where I'm multiplying these by these, I don't care, it's order alpha square. So let me write that. I have first a piece which is minus a mu a t a this times this, right? Alpha d t d, right? And I hope the signs and factors of i are okay. Now this piece, so it's plus i alpha b tb times this guy a mu a t a right plus order alpha square terms so i dumped another term in here and this part of course you can see there's a commutator here right this is uh, uh, just uh, an index right summed over i can rename it b to make it more explicit right alpha b and and a a right the a mu a field are numbers right so they come out they they do commute with the rest so i have the commutator of ta with tb here you see so i want to write that explicitly right this whole piece here is just minus i 
a mu a alpha b, which factor in front, right? times the, this commutator t a t b. Right? And so if, if you know Lie algebras or saw our last video, you know this is the algebra of the group. So now I can use this and rewrite this guy. Right? Again, another color yet. This is minus, in fact, uh, not minus, I, the structure constant, F, A, B, C, T, C. Right? So if I use this together with that, right, this becomes just F, A, B, C, because there's an I here, a minus I there, right? A, mu, B, alpha C, T, A. I renamed the indexes a little bit, so I took uh, this A here, which was summed over and renamed it as B, right? Uh, and same for C and, 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 and B, right? I renamed everything to have T, A explicitly because I want to group it with these ones. I will do the same here. I can rename this T A and this alpha A. So I have every one of these pieces proportional to T A. And then you, you just reorder the F. If you do that uh, uh, even uh, number of, of reorderings, then there's no extra sign. And I hope all my signs are right here, right? But finally, what I got is that my guy is transforming as itself as expected for infinitesimal transformation right arbitrarily close to the identity plus this piece which is very analogous to what we get in the abelian case right this is a consequence of me requiring that the the, the symmetry is local so if alpha didn't depend on x this term goes away Right? But now there's a new piece. This is new, right? In, in an abelian theory, this commutator would be zero, right? So you wouldn't have this piece. So let me write the new piece. A, B, C. A, mu, B. Alpha, C. T, A, right? And now you can see that this gauge field is a multi-component object, right? It has a number, or it's a multiplet under this group, right? And it also rotates under this transformation. So I'm mixing the many components of this guy according to this rule, right? Uh, which is the important uh, new part. All the difference between the abelian gauge fields and the non-abelian gauge fields comes essentially from that part right there, right? Uh, which would also be present if the field was, uh, if you had a global symmetry, just, uh, for, I mean, in that case, you didn't need to introduce a gauge field, but in, anyway, this is the local part and this is coming from the non-abelian part of your theory. You could also, uh, factor out this TA, we have been carrying it together with the, the A mu, but now when you write it like that, you could write straight away just a transformation for A mu A, right? Just remove the TA from this equation, right? So again, since this is valid for all the generators, it must be true that the field itself transforms in this way, see, A mu B alpha C, right? And this one is nice because it shows us something that I, I claimed last video, but didn't show, but now it's really explicit here, which is the fact that the gauge boson is transforming under the adjoint representation of the group. Right? In order to see that, you just have to remember the definition of the adjoint representation and then rewrite this piece. Right? Let me rewrite this piece in this way. I want alpha C 
to the left, a mu b to the right, and this f a b c, if I bring it here, and now uh, just exchange these two guys, right, which gets me a minus sign. Now what I have in the middle here is a matrix that has this C contracted with the parameter alpha, right? And A, B are contracted, B especially is contracted here. So if you remember the definition of the adjoint group, this is just, right? This is uh, minus I T in the adjoint representation index C, right? And this is a, 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 the rows and columns of this matrix have indexes A and B. This is just the definition of the adjoint representation. Right? And that means that I'm getting a transformation, which is I alpha C T C, right? A, B, this is in the adjoint, right? A mu B, which is exactly what you expect from the infinitesimal transformation, right? I'm saying here that my a mu index a, right, is going to this part is the identity, which here is like a Kronecker delta a b, right? Plus, let's uh, ignore the the this part for now, right? Plus I, now this part, right? Alpha C, T, C in the adjoint, right? This guy has indexes A, B. Let me put it down here. Oops. A, B. Bring that down too, just for aesthetics. As I said before, these indexes, uh, they don't matter if they are up or down, a mu b, right? And of course, there's also the the local transformation, which is uh, again diagonal, right? It's not rotating uh, my field. It's not even proportional to the field. Yeah? Del mu alpha a. So see how this is happening is according to the adjoint representation of the field. And you have to notice this is independent of the representation for the mass content of my theory. Independent of the representation, I, I choose for the fermions and, uh, and uh, scalars, right? The gauge fields will be transforming under the adjoint, right? Because I didn't assume anything. You see, I'm, I'm keeping these TAs arbitrary here. They, this is valid for any representation, right? Remember that I suppressed this index, but it is there. But whatever the representation was, the transformation for the gauge field would be this one, right? And that's what is implying that the gauge field transforms in the adjoint, right? Uh, this is also important because as we have seen before, uh, uh, adjoint representations of SUN, right, which is what we have in mind in the background here, are real, right? So these will be a real field, um, which is important because these will, guys will be their own particles and so on, right? Another thing to notice here, very important one, is that now um, this piece, right, means that when I build, uh, uh, um, for now it's, it's just the fact that if they transform under the group, right, that means in a general way that will be, they will be also ch charged under the group, right? Uh, whatever global charge that is conserved here will be carried by these guys too. They are just not neutral under that we'll see that uh, appearing explicitly pretty soon. Right? Another interesting definition that we could make, we could make, right, which is actually useful, but sometimes a little bit confusing, is to give a name for this object, right? Since we see that really this is 
something that always go together because this index for the gauge boson is always contracted with the generators of the group, right? They are tied together. It's useful sometimes to, to define a matrix gauge field of sorts, right? We can take that object and give it a name. Sometimes, and that's where it gets confusing, books will just call it a mu, but it's not the abelian a mu, which is just a vector field of numbers, right? This is a matrix actually, right? Because it is defined like that, a mu a t a, right? So it's a sum of all the, the, the generators for your group. So I like to put a M here just to remember this is a matrix because otherwise you might commute it with itself or other, other matrices in your theory and that would be a problem, right? And then the transformation property for this guy is pretty uh, simple and actually has a very nice interpret geometrical interpretation which we might get to in another video, right? So this transforms in this way, right? V dagger of X, which is just a rewriting of this equation up here, now using that object, right? And here we have a couple of examples, just to make this clear. So if you take SU2, right, as we have seen, it has uh, three generators, which we usually take if the fermions and scalars are in the fundamental. Uh, we take it to be the three Pauli matrices over two, right? And in any case, you have three components for the gauge field. So you have three gauge fields for SU2 local theory, and you can package these three gauge fields in a matrix uh, gauge field in this way. You just contract it with the three Pauli matrices, so you see the usual uh, structure for Pauli matrices. In, in fact, I'm missing this, factors, uh, this factor one half here. In the case of SU3, uh, you have eight generators, right? In the fundamental, the, uh, we take those to be the Gelman uh, matrices, right? You can look for the explicit form of these matrices online. It's very easy to find, right? And since we have eight generators, now we have eight uh, different gauge bosons. So if you ever heard that we have eight different gluons, right? Uh, this, is, this is the reason. They are not really different because this symmetry is exact in QCD. So you have eight gluons, but they are all uh, indistinguishable, right? And of course, using the Gelman matrices, you can contract these eight guys and you get these big matrices, matrix, right? So it, it looks like a, a complicated object. You would, in principle, prefer this one, I bet, right? But when you're talking about, uh, uh, um, the, the, especially when you want to talk about symmetry breaking, putting these things into these matrix forms is very useful, right? I, I won't be able to convince you right now, but uh, all you have to, to really convince yourself is that it's a kind of complicated thing, but the information is the same that is contained here. Just reorganize the fields in a way that it transforms from the left and from the right with this unitary transformation here. And that's why this is useful. Now, of course, now I want to take one step further, right? I introduce my gauge field. Now I need a kinetic term for it, right? I have, I need something which is equivalent to the F mu nu that I got in the abelian case, right? I had this guy, right? Which was a gauge invariant. And now I want to find an equivalent for this non-abelian um, uh, theory. Uh, it's not immediately obvious which is what object I should define for that, right? And we will use a, true, a trick that we could, in principle, have used to find F menu in the abelian case. You just have to, to notice that this covariant derivative acting on psi, so thinking first of the abelian case. 
it goes into the exponential of i alpha x del mu psi, because this is the definition of the covariant derivative, right? But that also means that if now I take another derivative, let me change the index, del nu, d, d nu, d mu of psi, right? This, out, this object also transforms in the same way this object does. So it also goes in exponential of the same thing. Right now, I don't even need the brackets. It's understood that the derivatives act on everything to their right, right? And that allows me to write the following identity, right? Uh, I can just take the two or different orderings for this guy, just apply the same logic with del mu being applied after del nu, and then I can write a commutator for these derivatives. Implicitly, whoever is to the left is, is acting on everyone that is to the right. These will also transform in the same way the field itself does, right? Because I'm always just applying covariant derivatives, right? So they transform in the same way the object they are acting on transforms, right? And now this, there's a nice identity here. I won't do the calculation for the abelian case because I'll have to do again for the non-abelian, but it's pretty easy to show, just explicitly write these covariant derivatives in the abelian case, and you show that del mu, del nu, acting on psi of x is i e here e is the electric charge right f mu nu psi of x right to show that you just have to to write these covariant derivatives explicitly and and expand uh, the expression you get uh, del mu a uh, del mu a nu minus del nu a mu, right? The important thing that this shows us is that this commutator of co covariant derivatives is not a derivative itself, right? This is not a differential operator. It's now just uh, uh, this tensor, right? And if I compare this expression, take this one, and now compare with the one above it, right? That means that this f mu nu psi of x, which is this ob object on the left, right? Minus a constant, right? This i e here is just a constant, right? It goes into f mu nu exponential of i alpha x, and I know these two guys commute because there's no derivatives acting on anything outside f mu here, right? Times psi of x, right? I could write this exponential to the left here rigorously, but I can pass it to the right and then find here the psi prime, right? This is how the psi transforms. And if you look at this expression, if psi went into psi prime and f mu went into itself, it means that this guy is invariant under the transformation. So, so if uh, usually the way we get f mu in 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 the abelian case is just write f mu and prove that it does not transform under the gauge symmetry by just using the transformations of a. But you could use this commutator to find an object that is invariant in the transformation, just use covariant derivatives, and then name that object f mu nu, right, minus some constant. And it will involve derivatives on the gauge uh, field. In fact, it will involve two derivatives in the gauge field, so it will contain the kinetic term for the gauge field. That's the important thing. I have I, What I'm looking here is for an object that is invariant, or has uh, well-known 
transformation properties and involves two derivatives of the field, right? If I find that, I found an uh, object that I can use to build a kinetic term for the gauge field. Right? So I'll do that for the non-abelian case now. I just want to calculate this commutator, right? And see how it transforms. Doing exactly this calculation in the non-abelian case will tell me how this object that contains two derivatives and the gauge field transforms. That's what I want, right? So let's go for it. I start with this, del mu, del nu acting on psi. So now I'm thinking about the non-abelian uh, um, covariant derivatives. I know this transforms like that because again, same logic I used before. I'm only applying covariant derivatives to this guy. So the whole thing should transform in the same way as psi does. So you get this V of X. And now I, I need to calculate explicitly this commutator, right? Which I didn't do for the abelian case, but now do you will be able to see because the abelian case is just a uh, particular case of the non-abelian one, right? So let's write this explicitly, right? Remember my covariant derivative is up here. Let me copy the definition of it so you can keep an eye on it and see I'm not cheating in any way. Let's keep the definition of the covariant derivative here and calculate the commutator, right? Uh, psi is always to the right. I don't have to worry about psi too much. Just remember that I, I have in mind that this is always acting on psi, right? So let's do it. The first piece is just the normal derivatives, del mu, del nu. Again, this is acting on psi, but this is symmetric, right? I can exchange that. So this part will be zero. Then I have the cross term, right? It's minus i g a mu and to avoid keep uh, rewriting this again and again i use the matrix which is this contraction right del mu acting on psi again minus i g del mu a m mu right so the two possibilities right and now the term where this goes in twice, right? So there's minus g square a mu m a mu m, right? And psi. So you see, this is the term that would be zero in the abelian theory, right? Because now this, these guys commute with each other. This is not because that this is a different derivative acting in the field, right? In this case, the derivative is acting on the field and then on psi, and this is the other way around, right? So you have to be careful with the derivatives here. I can open these up and conceal a few terms, right? So when the derivative is acting on psi, in both cases, I'll have the exactly the same expression. So it goes away and all I'm left with is when this derivative actually acts on the field. That will be in this case i g del nu a mu m times psi, right? The derivative is only acting in this guy in this case, right? Minus i g from here. In this case, the derivative acts first on this guy and not on psi, right? uh, which is just this. The ones where the derivatives act on psi, you have the exact same expression, right? And you can conceal uh, both. And then you have this term just sitting there. A nu m, right? And this object now, right? is what I will call um, 
uh, the, the, F, the field strength uh, tensor, right? So let me just remove a factor of IG. So let me define it in this way. I'll call this minus IG times F mu nu matrix, right? That this is all, th these are all matrices, right? But then I can rewrite this guy in this way. If I want a guy that only involves the gauge fields and not the, the generators, right? So, okay, what I did obtain here, now I don't need this anymore, right? Is a uh, definition for my field strength tensor and I need to see how it transforms, right? So let me just rewrite it more explicitly down here, right? So rigorously what I have proven is returning the Psi here is that this is the same as minus I G F mu nu matrix Psi that's what I have shown here. And now I want to write this guy explicitly, right? So F mu nu A, T A is equal to all of these. Del mu A nu A T A minus del nu A mu A T A minus I G times this commutator which is now I'll read, write explicitly a mu a t a a mu b t b and uh, this part again I can take these fields outside and I have the commutator of t a with t b which again is given by the algebra of the group right which I can rewrite, right? I can take this whole piece, or oh, there'll be an extra factor of I coming from the algebra. I have, I can just reorganize everything and rewrite this as G, A mu B, A mu C, F, A, B, C, T, C. Right? And then it's just a, a, a matter, uh, TA actually. I already renamed it appropriately, right? I cannot have C twice. So now I can take this TA out, right? And rewrite the field strength tensor in this way, which is what I wanted. Del mu A nu A minus del nu A mu a plus G F A B C A mu B A mu C. So this is uh, finally a very enlightening, right? I have the same thing I had for a field strength tensor in the abelian case plus a new piece. Right? And this new piece makes all the difference, right? Because now I have these quadratic terms in the fields here, and that will lead to a lot of new effects, right? But before we do that, let's see how this guy uh, transforms, right? We know from up here that this object transforms in this way. Let me copy that. And at the same time, I know that this guy goes, right, transforms as Vx Psi x, right, if I do a transformation. And that implies a transformation for that guy, right? So if I, I write that explicitly, right, now using this, right, let me write it here. What I'm saying is that minus i g f mu m psi x 
goes into minus ig something, right? I, I, I want to know how this guy transforms, right? I, I want that to appear here, right? But this guy transforms, this guy transforms as v of x, psi of x, right? And the constraint is from this equation that the whole thing should be minus ig v of x f e nu m psi of x, right? I'm just using this is this left side here, this is this last term on the right side. And then if I look at what should appear here so that v commutes to the front, remember now this is a matrix, v just doesn't go to the other side easily, right? You see that clearly this guy needs to transform. You need a v to the left here, right? f me nu m, and I knew you need a v dagger here so that these two conceal each other and you have a v to the left here, right? And that fixes the transformation of f me nu. Now f me nu for non-abelian theories does not this is the matrix, right? So I have to write it that way. So the field strength tensor is not invariant under non abelian transformation. It actually transforms in this way, right? Again, with V dagger to the right and V to the left, right? Which is a typical transformation for this kind of object, right? This matrix. Uh, objects, right? If you, you can do also the infinitesimal one, I won't do that explicitly here, you can do it yourself, just take these uh, uh, these guys inf infinitesimally and then isolate f me nu a, it will transform in this way, me nu a minus f a b c alpha c f me new uh, alpha b actually here f me new c which again is uh, the joint representation right um now you say well we are in a problem here because uh before f me new was an invariant so i just had to to put it in a lagrangian in a Lorentz invariant way, so I just contract f me nu with another f me nu, and I get a kinetic term, right? Now, now it's not that easy, but it's not that hard either. All you have to do is to notice that this transformation is very useful, and you're dealing with matrices. Essentially, you're seeing uh, the, the transformation properties for this guy, right? It's always this matrix version. Right? And you know that in Lagrangian you shouldn't have matrices. The way you build scalars out of matrices is by taking traces, which is a good tip in the right direction. And then you notice that this trace, if I take the trace of f mu nu a t a, so this object, contract it with itself, and now mu nu matter if it's down or up, so I'm putting up and bringing the order index down just to keep it out of the way, right? So essentially what I'm calculating is the trace of f mu nu matrix, f mu nu matrix, right? This transforms, right, in a very convenient way, which is this one, right? So vx f mu nu a t a v dagger, so that's the transformation for the first guy. The second guy gets Vx F mu nu B T B V dagger. And now the trace is cyclic, right? So these two guys are just the identity, but this guy can come all the way over there, right? And go away too. So the trace itself is invariant.
And that's a thing I can put straight away in my Lagrangian. It is, it is Lorentz invariant, it is gauge invariant, right? And that's what we wanted. You can even write it in a nicer way, right? Just rem remind yourself that f min u a and f min u b are numbers, so these guys can come out of this trace. And then you have the trace of ta tb which which we have defined before right you want some normalization condition for these guys right in the case of the fundamental of sun you take this to be half of delta ab Right, that, this is that coefficient c r, which in the the fundamental it took to be half, right? And then this becomes just half of f f mu nu a f mu nu a. Now a is summed over because you contracted b with this delta here, right? And this is usually written around, which causes a lot of confusion too, but I hope it's clear in this context as this thing right here, f mu nu a square. Right? Now you just have to do some canonical normalization for this, right? You could write this in the uh, Lagrangian proportional to any number and you choose the number so that the, the um, I mean, the kinetic term has actually has an interpretation of uh, kinetic energy and, and then you can write this Lagrangian in two ways, right? So you have to be careful not to get confused, but it is the same way of writing, right? So what you see around is either write this as minus half of the trace and now the trace sometimes you see it written just like that right but what that means since it is the trace right is that you have the matrix version of this field strength tensor so this object here right or sometimes you see this written as minus one fourth of f mean u a squared. Sometimes people suppress this a and then it gets really confused should I take the trace or not, right? But in this case, I'm just summing over this uh, index, right? Keep in mind, it's exactly the same. Uh, these are identical to each other. You just need to be careful with notation, right? Now, the important thing to remember is that since this guy right here has this last term, right? Let me move it down here, right? The moment I take this guy times itself, right? Take the square of this guy. I'll have a kinetic term, right? So I'll have terms with two derivatives, that's fine. But I also have, I'll also have terms involve products between these terms and these, which will have three powers of the field, right? And this term squared, which involves four powers of the field. So now we have uh, Feynman rules. Once I quantize, right? So far I'm doing dealing only with a classical field theory, right? This is actually a revision of classical non-abelian uh, gauge field theories, right? But once I quantize this, this thing will lead to a triple gauge vertex, and this thing will lead us, will give us a, a four uh, interaction of four gauge fields, and that's where the self interaction of non abelian gauge fields is coming from, right? From this piece, you see, if I had an abelian theory, all structure constants are zero, and this goes away. Right? You can always go back to the abelian one, just making the structure constants uh, go to zero, right? 
uh, I mean, there are a few details you need to be careful about, but roughly, at least in the classical field theory, this is true, right? Now, if I add to this, this is what some, sometimes people call a pure young mills theory, right? Just gauge fields, you have interactions, so you could do scattering of these guys, you could have bound states, glue balls, and all of that, right? But most of the time, people are really looking at fermions that interact by the exchange of these gauge fields. And then you can put a, 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 um, a fermionic field. And that's what most, most places, this is what called call a young mills theory, right? And it looks like that. You have a covariant derivative for the fermions, which will induce uh, interactions between these fermions and the gauge field plus a piece for the gauge fields themselves. Okay. And you have a theory, right? This is, uh, if, you, if you take uh, the symmetry to be SU3, right? The local SU3, then this guy is the glue and this is a quark, right? This is a, a theory of quarks is just one quark, right? The important, another important thing to notice is that the coupling between the gauge fields will be co controlled by this coupling G, right? But also the interaction between the fermion and the gauge field will be controlled by G because it's all coming from the, the covariant derivatives. In the, in the way we actually defined uh, the field strength tensor here, it's really clear that all, all the interactions are coming from the covariant derivative, right? And, and that means that this, this theory right here has only one coupling constant, despite having more than one type of interaction, right? You have this one, two, now, right? Uh, fermion, fermion gauge field, but that's also controlled by the same coupling, right? Finally, since we are in the classical field theory, you can write, you can apply here Euler-Lagrange equ equations and get the classical equation of motion. It looks like that. I won't derive it here, right? Doesn't matter for us that much, right? Uh, a, B, C, A, B, mu, F, mu, C is equal to minus G, the coupling, right? It times the current, and this current is just, you have a current for each gauge field, right? Again, you have these indexes, this index which counts the number of generators appearing everywhere, right? And the current is very similar to the one from the abelian case, but now you have the generators here, which carries uh, this uh, index, right? And that's the conserved current for the global version of the symmetry we are assuming for our system, right? And so this is all I, I, I want to say about the classical uh, version of this theory. Uh, next video, we'll go on uh, and quantize these. We already know how to quantize the fermion. Nothing changes there, right? We we'll have to treat the, the, the interaction perturbatively, so also nothing changes. But quantizing the gauge field has a few details that are, are important and didn't appear in the abelian case. And we'll have to do that carefully. See you then.